I want you to turn with me to the prophecy of Isaiah, please, and the chapter 1. Prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 1. I wasn't going to uh, say anything tonight, but these verses were laid powerfully upon my heart in past days, and when that happens, I feel I should share uh, it with you because the Lord speaks to us through his word, and we're looking to hear from God and his word tonight. Isaiah chapter 1, uh, and, and the verse 1. We'll just comment on some of these verses as we go down them. What relevant stuff there is here for the day in which we live. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Let me just stop now for a moment or two here. We know from dates and times that Isaiah was in his late teens, only in his late teens when God called him into the into the ministry. He called him in as a young prophet to the nation of Judah. A prophet in the scriptures is one who forth tells. He declares forth the word that the Lord gives him. And Isaiah did that, and he uh, not only was a forth teller, but a foreteller. Prophet foretells as well. He tells of things that's going to happen ahead. There were God's emergency men in Christ's hour uh, that God raised up to protect and to bring back Israel, bring them back to God. And this man, uh, Isaiah, foretold as well as foretold. Of course, he foretold the, vir the virgin birth of Christ, Isaiah 7, Isaiah 9. He foretold the death of Christ, Isaiah 52 and 53, and he foretold the coming again of the Lord <clears throat> in chapter 65 and 66. Now, in order to show that he was credible, his credibility and his stickability, the Holy Spirit tells us that he prophesied and under the reign of four kings. And those kings, if you count them up, were a span of 51 years. So he was the right age when he had the job done. And two of the kings, Josiah and Jotham, were prosperous kings. They lived in prosperous times. And the other two mentioned here, Ahaz and Hezekiah, were problematic. They lived in troubled times. But whether the word come from the Lord to the wicked Ahaz or whether it came to the godly Hezekiah, the prophet always delivers the word without fear or favor of man. And that's what he did. You see, prophets are not puppets pondering to any hierarchy or any government or any leaders or any boards or any elders. They're men who come before God and wait before God for the message and then they deliver the message at any cost, whatever it means, they deliver the message. They're not, not in business of trying to keep a job, or trying to keep a manse, or trying to keep a people happy. They're there just to hear from God and bring the word of God to the people. There was no price tag could be put on any of these great prophets of God that God raised up. They announced, they pronounced, and they denounced. Thus saith the Lord, turn or burn, repent or perish, flee. That was the word that God gave them. And uh, there were men who were voices. Uh, we know from John the Baptist, he was a voice crying in the wilderness, not like many of us today, and I include myself at times, who repeat other people's stuff. 
We regurgitates other people's stuff and rehearses other people's stuff. These people got messages right from the very heart of God and they delivered it with all power that they could. Now, although he was related to royalty, this man, and he had kings in his family, he had no education, little or none. He had no doctorates, he had no degrees, he had no diplomas, he had nothing else. All he had here in verse 1 was a vision. You see that? The vision of Isaiah. Now, that word vision is a very interesting word that can be uh, translated or meant in two ways, but here the, the word vision means a message. He got a message direct from God. You see, I often say to young people, a vision is something that's caught, it's not taught. You can't teach men like this. You can't teach men that's before God and waiting on God. You can't teach them in colleges, seminaries, universities, or, or anywhere else. A vision is something that's caught. And would to God we would have young men and women in our land in these last days would catch a vision from God. And when men and women catch a vision and they hear this word and they're before God on their knees and they're crying unto God and God gives them a vision of something that needs to be done. And boy, there's so much need to be done. And would to God that we had young men and women, any man or woman that will lie before God and wait for the Lord to give them and catch that vision of perishing souls, catch that vision of the need in our land and, and, and so on. How long this man was in the secret place as a teenager, I don't know. But he emerged with a word of awesome judgment for the nation of Judah. In fact, this is the last message that God sent through Isaiah to the nation of Judah before he took them into captivity. This is God's final word through this young prophet because of the sin and the immorality of the people. In the next chapters, you'll read that he pronounced five woes. And then the last woe in chapter 6 was on himself. But the five woes of chapter, in these next chapters, it's interesting to study them because he, God gives them the woes of the nation. Now, how he describes them is in verse 4. Look at verse 4. A sinful nation, a people laden or bound, bowed down or bowed over with iniquity, or with evil, corrupt practices. A sinful nation, a people bowed over with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They've forsaken the Lord. They've provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger, and they're gone away. They're gone away backward. Look at verse 9 and 10. He compares them to Sodom. This is serious, you see. God's angry with his people. And in verse 9, except the Lord of hosts has left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of, our, of your God, ye people of Gomorrah. He's, he's, he's likened them unto Sodom and Gomorrah in that day. He's not mincing his words because God has given him this word. You see, we tend to think of Sodom and Gomorrah just of immorality and sexual sins. But you know, Ezekiel 16 and 49 says this about Sodom and Gomorrah, and it's something that we would need to study. He says, in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, the Lord says in the days, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the common son of man. These are the days in which we live. Ezekiel 16 and 49 says, the iniquity of Sodom was pride, fullness of bread, and an abundant idleness. Boy, are we not living in that day. That's a different tune now to the immorality of Sodom. This is something Ezekiel shows us in the spirit, a bond of idleness. I'll tell you, it's coming a day when boys will want to work and they'll not be able to work. And a uh, bundle of idleness and fullness of bread. Boy, we throw out more food. Freezers are full. But I'm not a prophet and... I would not predict anything, but I, I tell you, I believe a famine's coming to the land. I believe it with all my heart. Do you know that in the 1920s that the Germans drove their Mercedes into farmers' fields and left them there to get carrots and potatoes to eat? We could be heading towards a famine because that's judgment. 
And God knows he has tried everything else and we haven't repented. You don't say that I said that there was a famine, but it's looking like it. Bit by bit, God will wear us down until there's repentance, until there's brokenness, until we get back to God in the way that we could. Now, someone described this first chapter of Isaiah as a courtroom scene. The nation of Judah was the criminal or the defendant. God was the judge. Isaiah was the prosecutor. And heaven and earth were the jury. Look at verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children. They have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner and the ass his master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people does not consider a sinful nation. Now, what is, the, what is God saying to the prophet here? And what is the prophet doing here? He's calling, first of all, heaven as witness. He's calling to the heaven. He's, he's calling to all the seraphims and all the cherubims and all the millions of saints already there to bear witness to the fact. To bear witness to the fact that God has brought up his children. He has selected them. He has called them. He has ordained them. He has nourished them. He has fed them. He has protected them. And he has blessed them and they've turned against him. Heaven, bear witness to what I have given to my people and what I have done for my people. And then he turns to the earth. He says, let the heavens give ear. The earth, uh, I have nourished in river. The ox knoweth his owner and the ass his master's crib, but Israel does not know, know, know my people. Boy, I tell you, my friend, the old ox or the cow or the dog will come when you call them. And my people are rebellious rebellious they have turned against me they have and he's calling the heavens and he's calling the earth and he's calling the earth when he's talking about the earth he's talking about the seasons summer winter spring all come at the bidding of God the birds and the bees and all are fed by his mighty hand they all obey him the wind and the waves obey him but my people my people have rebelled against me And that's the message that he sent. And rebellion is the key word in these early chapters of Isaiah. Rebellion. I want to say a few words about rebellion before we go to prayer tonight because God has laid it on my heart. Look at verses 5 and 6. Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint from the sole of the foot even unto the head. There's no soundness in it but bruises and putrefying sores. They've not closed, now they're bound to. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burnt with fire. Now, when I began to think about that today, I think of all the sins, of all the sins and iniquities of, of the people of God. Rebellion's the worst sin. God hates rebellion. He hates rebellion for the one of the reasons is that he has been so blessed and so good. Imagine us living the other side of the cross. Remember what Jesus done for us at the cross and what he has done for us, lifting us out of darkness, saving us, delivering us, setting us free. And yet we rebel in so many ways against him. Rebellion is an awful thing in the eyes of God. Worse than murder. Worse than homosexuality. It's, the, it's, it's worse than an, it's the only sin that has a demonic element to it. Witchcraft. Witchcraft. And would to God that we in the church would examine our lives and see where there's any rebellious nature in us. You remember he said to King Saul, that evil man, that became an evil man, he was full of the Holy Ghost, he was head and shoulders above all, he did see mighty exploits for God. But then he got into problems came in. And uh, remember he offered up sacrifices and he thought by offering up the sacrifices that he was pleasing God. But you can't please God with sacrifices. Because he, he, says, to, he says to him, to obey is better than sacrifices. To hear, to listen to me and to do what I am saying is far better than sacrifices. Look at verse 11 in the chapter. To what purpose, he says, is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, said the Lord. 
I am, full of, I am full of the burnt offerings and rams and the fat of fed beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks or lambs or goats. When you come before me, you appear you, you, you have required this at your hand to tread me. Bring no more vain oblations. I tell you, they were offered up lambs and goats and heifers, and this man Saul had offered up a big sacrifice to God, waiting on Samuel to come. And God says, I see nothing in the sacrifice. And my friend, the table means nothing to us on Sunday morning if the heart's not right. The table means nothing to God if the heart's not right. He sees all these things going in and out and through and all the riches and all the traditions and all the pharisaical stuff. But if there's rebellion in the heart, God hates it. Rebellion is the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is the iniquity, is as iniquity and idolatry. Now in that verse 5 and 6 that we read, we have the picture of the leper. And I want to teach you something just as I close tonight. There's a powerful picture of a leper, of the leper here. Can't you see it? In verse 6, from the sole of your foot even unto the head, there's no soundness in wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They've not been closed up. Now they're bound up. Now they're mollified with ointment. And then he goes on to say, your country is desolate. This is, this is leprosy of a nation. It's not leprosy of a person. This is a nation of Judah that's in this state. Look at your country is desolate. Your cities are burnt with fire. Our cities are not burnt with literal fire today, but they're burn, burning with fires of lust. 52, I said, uh, and I got it wrong, 56 uh, the ones in the MPs in the House of Commons are being queried for sexual offences. 56. Child abuse. And different other things. There's a whole list of them to give it out on the news. That's, a, that's at the seat of government. Full of wounds and bruises and putrefying tours. And it says here the land, the devour, the, 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 the land is devoured. Your country is desolate, verse 7, and your cities are burnt with fire and your land strangers devoured in, in your presence. 500 churches in London in the last decade have been closed up and 423 mosques have been opened. And they're drinking and dancing. The head of the express there, the time of that thing was gone and, 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 and Downing Street had baked him. Boy, it is it vexed to read it. Uh, sickness, fighting, drinking, dancing in the heart of government when the whole people were locked up. Judgment is coming. And the land is desolate, my friend, is desolate from the head to the whole, from the top. This is talking about the nation here. Leprosy, now listen to what I'm going to say. Leprosy is the only sick, sickness and disease that Jesus never healed. Four times the Lord Jesus speaks about the leper and it's always about cleansing the leper. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper. And I think as we close tonight, leprosy, rebellion, and leprosy. And you can develop it yourself. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will turn from heaven and I will heal their lands, forgive their sins, and heal their land. Our land needs cleansed. There has to be cleansing. There has to be cleansing before there's healing. You can heal a wound that's not cleansed, but you'll have an infection. There's got to be cleansing before there's healing. And that's something that we recoil from and we run from because that is repentance. They're all right talking and praying out in their prayer, I mean, Lord, heal the land, heal the land. But there's stuff to be sorted out before the healing comes. 
You need cleansing before healing. Psalm 51, what did the psalmist say? Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. That awful sin with Bathsheba and the murder and all the rest of it, he wasn't calling for healing, he was calling for cleansing. Hebrews 10 and verse 22, let us draw near and have our bodies washed with pure waters. I'll tell you, bodies need to be washed, minds need to be washed, hands need to be washed, feet need to be washed. 1 Corinthians 6, the Corinthian church, you know, to, to say that you were a Corinthian in, in, in those days was you were despised, laughed at, mocked at, because it was such a sinful place, evil place. Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, he says, there were thieves and covetous and drunkards and homosexuals and extortioners, but now ye are washed, sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. <laughs> I tell you, those boys need washed. We sing it, we know it, it's full of scripture. Wash me in the blood of the Lamb, and I shall be whiter than snow. I want to emphasize again, if a wound is healed and not cleansed, it may take a time, but there's problems. The last state will be worse than the first. Now let me, as I close, just for a moment, link up some of the leprosy and rebellion as far as God is concerned because that's why that prophet is that he's thinking about leprosy when he's talking about the nation. Remember Naaman? It wasn't healing Naaman wanted, it was cleansing. And he flew into a rage and rebellion came into him. And God, when the prophet told him to go down and wash Go down to the Jordan and dip yourself seven times and wash and you'll be clean. But he went into a rage. You see, we, when we touch this repentance, my friend, and we touch these inward sins that we love and things that we have that were hard to get out of, it, we cover them over with prayer, we cover them over with the table, we cover them over with daily readings, we cover them over whatever way we like, but there has to get to the root before this fruit. There has to be purging. In the body politic of the church, if we're going to see, if we're going to see any revive, go wash in the Jordan seven times. What about Uzziah, King Uzziah, intoxicated with pride and pomposity and rebellion? Boy, he took the... Nobody could stand him. It took 80 priests to get him out of the sanctuary when he went in. Rebellion, he went into the holy place where he had no right to go and God struck him with leprosy in the head. Rebellion. What about Miriam? Oh, I tell you, Miriam. And Aaron started to mock Moses. And started to talk about... The Leprosy, leprosy starts with the mouth, you know. I'm told it starts with mucus that comes out of the mouth. And we need to be careful what we do with our, what we say with our mouths. They started to criticize, they started to criticize Moses, Moses' wife. Don't you be talking about another man's wife. Don't you be talking about another Christian in this church. Don't you be talking about it because you could be struck with leprosy. Birth your leprosy. And God just struck, struck Miriam with leprosy. And she went as white as snow. They go as white as snow. But you know, whenever we're cleansed, we go as white as snow too. That's what Isaiah says over in this chapter. Time wouldn't tell me to talk about Gehazi, who went into a rage and took away them and told lies and all, and he was struck with leprosy. Rebellion. You'll find rebellion and leprosy time and time and time again matched together. Look at, look, look, look at verse 16 of this chapter as we come to a close. 
He's only thirst I'm throwing it. Wash ye. Make ye clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. The father has pleaded for the widow. Here's to the nation this mighty plea. Come now and let us reason together, said the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be as wool. Hallelujah. As white as wool. The scripture talks about our minds being cleansed. Boy, we need our minds cleansed in these days. We need the helmet of salvation on. And it talks about our hands being cleansed, clean hands and a pure heart. It talks about our hearts being cleansed. It talks about our feet being cleansed. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. God's looking for cleanliness and holiness amongst his people. Then the healing will come. When that uh, scalpel of the surgeon goes in and the blood comes out and blood will cleanse. You cover over that with an infection on it. I tell you, my friend, you have trouble. What I could quote scriptures for the next half hour. Let us cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh. But praise God, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Doesn't talk about he cleanses us from all sin. And on to him that loved us and loosed us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Hallelujah, in his own blood, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. I tell you, it's a mighty thing to be cleansed tonight. It's a mighty thing. The blood of Jesus continually cleanses from all sin. And boy, we need to cry at every step we take during the day. Cleansing. There's a fountain opened up for cleansing. Boy, I tell you, my friend, the scripture knows what it's talking about when it's talking about the blood that cleanses us from all sin. That precious, precious blood. The Revelation says they overcame him by the word of their testimony and the blood of the Lamb. And that rendered is, and because of the blood of the Lamb, <laughs> I am clean and holy, open to God tonight. May God search us. May the blood apply to our lives tonight. May we come into prayer with clean hands and a pure heart. May we praise God tonight. And he will answer our prayers.